good evening, uh, everyone who's uh, attending this uh, event tonight, uh, even those who are just walking in now. Um, for, for everyone's sake, I've looked around in the uh, lecture theatre we're in at UQ here, and we have about 20 people now, 20, 25, but uh, I understand we have up to 180 registrants, most of whom are watching online. So welcome if you are uh, one of those people watching online. My name is Colin Forrest. I'm a member of the Council of the Queensland Chapter of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And I have the absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce tonight's eminent speaker to you all. Michael Kirby really needs no introduction, but I shall give one. I say it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce him, not simply because of the man you all know him to be, but because I have known him for a long time in my own life and he had a profound influence on my life um, in, that, in, in respect of my legal career. I first met Michael as a young law graduate uh, who he took on as a legal associate uh, to work for him in the New South Wales Court of Appeal when he was president there in 1987. So I had the distinct privilege of working with a great jurist in Michael, but others around him, uh, Robert Hope, Sir Lawrence Street, Gordon Samuels, Dennis Marnie, Bill Priestley, absolutely incredible jurists. And um, as a young 27 year old law graduate, uh, it certainly um, caused me to want to work hard in my career as well. Michael, the Honourable Michael Kirby, ACCMG, who is a fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, as I said, was president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal after a stint uh, as a uh, chair of the Australian Law Reform Commission uh, and judge on the um, Commonwealth Arbitration, Conciliation and Arbitration Court from 1984 through to 1996. In 1996, he was appointed to the High Court of Australia where he served with distinction until 2009, a really distinguished uh, a career as a leading jurist uh, in Australian judicial history. Michael has, uh, since he retired from the High Court, or and even uh, during some of the time, I believe that he was still a judge, served in many different roles in the international sphere as well, um, particularly through the auspices of the United Nations. He's worked in uh, post-conflict Cambodia. He was, as many of you would know, uh, I, I believe it's, uh, his title was rapporteur in respect of um, an investigation into human rights in North Korea. Uh, he's worked in other post-conflict situations and world health crises, particularly taking a very uh, prominent and committed role in the fight against AIDS in the late 80s, that, around the time that I was working for him. Michael is going to talk to us tonight about a, a topic that's dear to us all right at this very moment. It, it is uh, the right of peoples to self-determination, and he's going to particularly address that subject in the context of the rights of the people of Ukraine to exercise self-determination. Michael, I'm going to call on you now to begin your address. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. It's good to see you. And uh, it uh, reminds me of those happy days when we worked together. And indeed, those days included some of the times uh, of the expert group of UNESCO on the rights of peoples to self-determination that I'm going to speak about uh, tonight. I don't think we discussed those matters. I uh, kept my international work quite separate, uh, but um, it's become relevant to reflect upon uh, the uh, work that I was involved in uh, in the 1980s. And that's exactly what I'm now going to do. Uh, I begin, as has become conventional in Australia, by acknowledging the Indigenous people all across our continental land. Uh, and a source of satisfaction to me on seeing a statement by uh, the new Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, was that he began his remarks um, by taking uh, the respects that we offer a step further and indicating 
that uh, his government is going to uh, implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart uh, and is going also to um, uh, ensure that uh, the rights of the Indigenous people uh, to be recognised in our national constitution will be examined uh, by uh, his government. And I think that will be a good thing. And it certainly isn't um, over, it isn't uh, something he's rushing into because it's been around for some considerable time. I also want to express thanks to the Australian Institute of International Affairs Queensland chapter. Uh, when I was a justice of the High Court, I used to come to a, a breakfast session that was organised uh, in Queensland and speak to the Queensland chapter of the AIAA. And uh, they were very happy and constructive meetings because um, it's very good to meet lawyers who are actually interested in international affairs. I didn't always find that to be the case in the High Court of Australia. But uh, I therefore am pleased to be with you all tonight uh, and I honour the uh, work of the AIIA on international affairs. I also uh, want to um, express congratulations to our chair tonight, Colin Forrest, who today, I think it was, was sworn into office uh, as a judicial uh, sessional member of QCAT. And that's a very good step. Uh, and I'm delighted to see it. Whatever else is said elsewhere, Colin, no one could claim that uh, your appointment has come about by um, any corrupt means. Uh, you have earned respect by your long service in the judiciary, federal judiciary, and uh, I'm very proud of you. Now, the um, Russian Federation invaded uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, on the 24th of February uh, of this year. Uh, and uh, this came as a great shock and had unleashed uh, a, a series of uh, military operations called by the Russian Federation president, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, a special operation. That phrase is not one of military uh, provenance. It is a, a term that was used uh, by the KGB. And um, it is uh, something that Mr. Putin would have known in the years, many years that he served as an officer of the KGB. Uh, and uh, his attack on uh, Ukraine came notwithstanding the fact that he'd repeatedly denied that there was any intention to invade Ukraine, but invade he did. Uh, and the best explanation uh, that I've seen for his purposes in invading Ukraine came in a speech he made to the Russian people, um, which has been little noticed, but being a contemporaneous record of what was going on in his mind on the 22nd of February, 2022, two days before the invasion, it's a very useful uh, source of uh, information on what President Putin was thinking about when he unleashed uh, the war machine of the Russian Federation. And he said this two days before the invasion. Two years before the collapse of the USSR, its fate was actually a foregone conclusion. Uh, it emboldened the radicals and nationalists including and above all in Ukraine, to attribute to themselves the merit of gaining independence. Despite all these injustices, deceit and outright robbery of Russia, our people, namely the people of Russia, recognized the new geopolitical 
realities that arose from the collapse of the USSR. They recognized the new independent states, Russia being itself in a difficult situation at that time, helped its partners in the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States, including Ukrainian colleagues, from whom, right from the moment of independence, numerous requests for material support began to arise. And our country provided such support with respect to the dignity and sovereignty of Ukraine, which itself was infected with the virus of nationalism and corruption and skillfully replaced the true cultural, economic and social interests of the people. The real sovereignty of Ukraine with various kinds of speculation, uh, citing national soil and external ethnographic paraphernalia. Uh, and uh, President Putin went on that Ukraine was to be condemned for the lack of independent courts in Ukraine. People who consider themselves Russians and would like to preserve their identity, language and culture were made clear that they are strangers in Ukraine. Russians are expelled from schools, from all pub public spheres, even ordinary shops. There are reprisals against the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, and uh, he claimed that the seizure in 2014 uh, of the inhabitants of Crimea uh, had not been by a free choice, namely together with Russia. Uh, it was an action that was taken by uh, the then uh, party leader, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, uh, Mr. Khrushchev. Now, Khrushchev himself uh, had been born in Ukraine, but he came from a family of Russian-speaking uh, people who uh, went to Ukraine in search for work and found work in the coal mines of Ukraine, which were then a major source of employment. Uh, but uh, he was one of the few Ukrainians who rose up the ladder of power in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, and uh, when a time came about um, that uh, it was appropriate during his term as party leader to uh, acknowledge the 300th anniversary uh, of uh, a Ukrainian saint. He marked that occasion with a gift to Ukraine, to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic uh, of Crimea. And that gift was made without any consultation with the people of Ukraine, it probably didn't occur to anybody at the time that it was of much consequence because Ukraine with 15 other Soviet socialist republics was a member of the USSR and therefore it didn't much alter things. People could go freely between the different republics of the USSR and uh, it was said that this was one big happy family. And I'll come back to that in due course. But um, the issue uh, that I'm now going to address is the right of peoples to self-determination. Um, it really arose um, in the writings of John Locke, a an English philosopher, and it was given voice in the uh, Declaration of Independence of the United States of America. In that declaration, uh, famously written by John Madison, it said, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal status to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And he then went on to say, 
uh, and this was Jefferson, not Madison. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that the right of people to alter or to abolish their government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms as to them seem most likely to affect their security and happiness. So that was what uh, was said at the beginning of the American Republic. And it had a profound effect uh, in the United States. First of all, it had an immediate effect on the French Republic when that was declared uh, after 1789, uh, uh, 1789. Uh, and it um, had consequences uh, in the early history of the United States. Uh, which favoured self-determination by the Latin American countries, which were bound to Portugal and Spain. Uh, it didn't stop the American Republic from uh, claiming a dominion over Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippine Islands and Cuba, um, but uh, it was generally something deeply embedded in the American tradition. And it found a new voice uh, in 1918, as the United States had just joined the Allies in the First World War. Uh, and uh, he was called upon on the 4th of July, 1918, to express the war aims of the United States uh, in the First World War. And in doing so, he formulated the 14 points, uh, as was said at the time, four more than the almighty. But the 14 points included many statements about the significance of the right of the peoples uh, in contest in the First World War to be uh, able to enjoy and exercise a right to self-determination. And this was uh, one of the aims of the American uh, Republic in the First World War and it later influenced um, uh, Woodrow Wilson's successor, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when it came to asserting the objectives of the United States uh, in joining uh, Great Britain in the Second World War. <clears throat> this statement of objectives was um, made in the uh, famous Atlantic Charter. And the Atlantic Charter made it clear that neither Britain nor the United States would make any claims on other countries for gains out of the Second World War, that there would be a ter territorial adjustment, which, quote, must be in accord with the wishes of the peoples concerned and thirdly, that all people have a right to self-determination. These were three passages in the Atlantic Charter. Uh, I'm not sure that um, Prime Minister Churchill's heart went with those principles, but he was in a desperate situation. And so he signed on to the Atlantic Charter, uh, which uh, became a basis for the principles of the United Nations Charter uh, of 1945. The United St uh, Nations Charter, like the United States Constitution, uh, is expressed in terms of the peoples of the United Nations. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in equal rights of men and women of nations, large and small, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims in the United Nations. And uh, it was in those terms that Harry Truman, Roosevelt's um, successor as President of the United States uh, signed the um, United Nations Charter, 
Australia was also a signatory to the Charter, being one of the foundation members. And amongst the purposes of the United Nations, the second of these stated that it, they were to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. And the members of the newly formed organization promised to refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity and political independence of any state. So these were the promises of the Charter of the United Nations made in the name of the peoples of the United Nations. And uh, these were the principles that were adopted in San Francisco in 1945. Uh, <clears throat> the developments uh, since then have included the Universal Declaration, and that was followed in 1976 by the International Covenant and civil and political rights and the international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights. And interestingly, the first article of both of those covenants uh, is the same. The same terms were used in the very first article of the two international covenants. And they include article 1.1. All people have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their international, their economic, social and cultural development. And uh, that became part of the treaty, which those who subscribe to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights had to subscribe to when they signed and ratified uh, that uh, those two charters. And uh, the Russian Federation as successor to the Soviet Union is bound by them. And so is Ukraine uh, as successor to the uh, Russian, to the um, Soviet Union. And so is Australia and the United States and most other countries. So this is the legal background to the issue of self-determination, but you will have seen that there is at its heart a problem. And the problem is that though the principles are stated in terms of uh, peoples, uh, they're stated in the context of states and the United Nations uh, was not expressed as the United Peoples of the world, it was called the United Nations and resolving the difference between the claims of nations over another nation or a part of a nation, such as we've now seen in Ukraine, uh, in the claims of the Russian Federation, uh, have to be resolved with the rights uh, guaranteed in the United Nations Charter of non-interference uh, with the sovereignty of uh, nation states. So this was the background to a, a development that occurred in the 1980s. At that time, uh, the Australian Prime Minister was Malcolm Fraser, and he did a generous thing. He appointed the former Prime Minister, whom he had ousted from office, uh, E.G. Whitlam, to be the Australian ambassador to UNESCO. This is a rather unusual thing in Australia where it's rather rare uh, in the bitterness of our politics, uh, which are a bit like religious politics, huge disputes over trivial matters. Uh, most governments don't give any support to predecessors, but Malcolm Fraser did. Uh, and, um, in 1980, his government appointed me to be a member of the Australian National Commission for UNESCO, which is set up under federal legislation and it is still in force. Uh, and um, uh, taking a little leave from my work uh, at that time, 
as chairman of the Australian Law Reform Commission, uh, I was sent to be a member of the Australian delegation to the General Conference of UNESCO taking place in Paris in 1983. This was before I was appointed to the Court of Appeal of New South Wales in 1984. Uh, but it was a very interesting conference. I had to work closely with E.G. Whitlam uh, and uh, in the opening session, there was an indication from three states, the United States of America, the United Kingdom and Singapore, that they objected to uh, any references in the UNESCO documents to the rights of peoples. They said that this was an expression that uh, was designed to take pressure off uh, the Soviet Union and its satellites in the matter of human rights, and that human rights were what mattered, and that they were going to pack their bags and leave UNESCO until they came to their senses and returned to uh, human rights rather than the rights of people. Um, in the course of my remarks, because I was assigned the responsibility of dealing with this objection, which was very important for UNESCO, because when those three states ultimately did withdraw from UNESCO for about 10 years, they took their money with them. And that was a very big blow to UNESCO at the time. Uh, it wasn't only that issue, they were also walking out because of the so-called New World Information Order, which was designed to ensure that in countries, including democratic countries, there would be more outlets for uh, reportage of facts and statement of opinion, something that might not be so uh, unimportant in our federal democracy in Australia. But uh, in any case, Australia was opposed to this walkout, uh, was defensive of the New World Information Order and uh, especially defensive of uh, the right to self-determination. And I was assigned the task to defend the right of self-determination. And it brought great pleasure to me to remind the Americans of the consistent path that they had followed in uh, supporting uh, self-determination of their own polity, but also of so many other polities, particularly in the 14 points, the Atlantic Charter, the Charter of the United Nations and the two great covenants of the United Nations. Um, however, um, uh, that led to the exit of the United States and the United Kingdom and Singapore. Uh, and uh, in the course of my speech, I said, I think this matter is not without ambiguity. What does the right of self-determination of peoples mean? Who are a people? And it appears that my remarks in that regard caught the ear of the UNESCO legal advisor. This is the top in-house lawyer to the director general. And the director general at the time was himself uh, a, a lawyer uh, Keba and Bai, and he uh, supported what I said, and indeed referred to it in his closing remarks uh, to the UNESCO General Conference, uh, which was that this could not just be dismissed out of hand, that there was an important point. What did self-determination of peoples mean? Who are a people to enjoy the right to self-determination? And how do they give expression to this right to self-determination? And as a result of that uh, humble suggestion that I made in my speech, I'm not seeking to aggrandize my role in all this, but simply to say that this is historically how it came about. The Director General of UNESCO set up an expert group and I was summoned from Australia, uh, first to be a member of the expert group, then to be the chairman of the expert group, and finally, to get to a real job in the expert group, which was as rapporteur of the expert group, uh, writing the report of the delegates who had come there. I remember the time when we first met in the expert group, uh, the uh, distinguished deputy director general, K. 
came along and he said, this is, he didn't use these words, a no brainer. This is a, a, an unimportant issue that we can all quickly agree on. Um, and I uh, unfortunately felt obliged to say that it's not really so easily dismissed, that it is complicated. And I cited an example because the Deputy Director General of UNESCO at the time was himself an Armenian, a Soviet official, a Soviet citizen, but a national, a person whose ethnicity was Armenian from the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republics, one of the 16 uh, of their republics. And I said, what would happen, for example, if some people in Armenia conceived that they had a right to self-determination vis-a-vis the Soviet Union. Uh, that statement, which was probably a bit undiplomatic, uh, but I was only a member at that stage, led to great mirth amongst the participants who were from the USSR, uh, and uh, particularly from the Deputy Director General who said, there is no source of disagreement about this in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. We are all members of a nation, a multicultural nation, uh, and uh, we all have a free right uh, to be members, and we all enjoy being members of the Soviet Union. But I had planted an idea which Mr. Karel Basak, the legal uh, delegate, uh, put into the mind and speech of the Director General, Keb Bai, and he uh, uh, then set up the expert group and um, I was appointed to be a member of the expert group and the expert group uh, did proceed to prepare a, um, a statement of principles uh, as to who was a people under the people's right to self-determination. Um, at the time, I didn't really know closely James Crawford. James Crawford, later a judge of the International Court, came to work in the ALRC, and I got to know him later, and I got to know his book, which was The Right of Peoples. And that uh, was a, an assistance that I didn't have at the time, but which later endorsed the approach that had been taken by the expert uh, group of UNESCO and recommended to the General Conference of UNESCO. And it said this, and think of this in relation to Ukraine, if you would, a group, uh, it said a people for the people's right of self-determination was one, a group of individual human beings who enjoy some or all of the following common features, common historical tradition, racial or ethnic identities, cultural homogeneity, linguistic unity, <clears throat> religious and ideological affinity, territorial connections, and common economic life. Two, the people concerned must be of a certain number, which need not be large, e.g. the people of a microstate, but which must be more than a mere association of individuals within a state. Three, the group as a whole must have the will to be identified as a people or the consciousness of being a people, allowing that particular groups or some members of such groups, though sharing the foregoing characteristics, might not have the will or consciousness and possibly four, the group must have institutions or other means of expressing their common characteristics and the will to form a united, uh, unified identity. Elsewhere, we recognize that sometimes a people who have a desire to be recognized as a people for self-determination would express that desire within another nation state. And the Aboriginal people of Australia were uh, most clearly in my mind at the time. Uh, the First Nations people uh, were in Australia 
people who qualified on all of the four points that I have mentioned and that were adopted by uh, the uh, expert group and also by the General Conference of UNESCO. Uh, but so were the 15, 16 countries of the Soviet Union. And so in particular was, were the people uh, of Ukraine. Um, if you go back to Mr. Putin's statement, uh, it's interesting that he is very strong in his condemnation of Lenin, which you don't see much criticism of, in, even in post-Soviet uh, Russia, uh, of Stalin uh, and of Khrushchev, but especially Khrushchev, especially Khrushchev, who had given away from the dowry of the Russian people, uh, a, a part of the Russian Federation where the a great majority of the people were Russian speaking and which had been a very important place in Russian history. And pursuant to uh, the notion, never expressed as such, but, but certainly a notion similar to uh, the notion of self-determination of peoples, in 2014, in a lightning strike, uh, Mr. Putin's Russian Federation marched into Ukraine, uh, seized its government, uh, and uh, expelled, uh, you, you, uh, seized the government of Crimea, expelled the uh, leaders of uh, Crimea who were Ukrainian, uh, and asserted a right to govern and held a referendum that has not been accepted by the international community, but which uh, returned a vote, which was substantially in support of the um, uh, seizure by the Russian Federation. This was followed soon afterwards by uh, the attention of the Russian Federation to the Donbass region of uh, Ukraine. This is the region on the shores of the Black Sea. It's very important to Ukraine and to its economy because it's the way they export grain to the world. They are the third largest exporter of grain, particularly to the developing countries, which has caused the Secretary General of the United Nations to beg the Russian Federation to make uh, clear the passage of the Ukrainian um, uh, grain export so as to feed poorer countries. But uh, that hasn't been done so far. Instead, a war broke out uh, led by the Russian Federation, which I think expected first that it would be over very quickly, just like the, the uh, seizure of Crimea, because they expected to be welcomed with open arms by the Russian speaking people in Donbass. Some did welcome them with open arms. That led to two areas in the Donbass region, uh, which um, are Donetsk and Luhansk. They are now um, separate republics, but they have been recognized by no other country except allies of the Russian Federation. Uh, and the war that we are now watching on our television screens every night is all about claiming the Donbass and claiming it from uh, the uh, people of Ukraine. The surprising to some, and certainly to Mr. Putin, I would think, uh, has been the fact that many of the people in the Donbass region, though they are Russian speaking, though they speak Russian at home, feel Ukrainian and don't necessarily want to be members of the uh, Russian Federation, citizens of that country. Um, and in fact, uh, the best explanation for this I've seen is that given by uh, the president of Ukraine, Mr. Zelensky, who said their troops, when they came into Ukraine, were shocked and amazed at the apparent wealth of Ukraine, at the stores full of goods, uh, at the 
quality of the buildings, at the standard of life that they found. Uh, and that may have persuaded Russian speaking people to feel sufficient link to Ukraine not to join in this uh, celebration of self-determination. And that is where the battle lies at the moment. Russia is slowly but inexorably gathering in some of these uh, lost brethren uh, given away uh, as Mr. Putin said in his speech two days before the war began, I cannot imagine what was in the mind of Comrade Khrushchev when he uh, he uh, delivered uh, Crimea to uh, Ukraine. I cannot I cannot understand what was in his mind unless it was some fitful uh, attitude towards multiculturalism and moving. Uh, Crimea into Ukraine. But um, the uh, reason given, uh, the other reason given was the uh, intention of Ukraine to align itself with NATO. NATO is seen in the Russian Federation as a, a serious threat to the safety of the Russian Federation. Um, because a number of NATO member countries, which are on the very border of the Russian Federation, have NATO weapons and NATO rockets, which are pointed at uh, the Russian Federation territory. And this is a source of uh, great anxiety. Under the rules in the Russian Federation for the use of nuclear, war, nuclear arms, there has to be an attack which is existential on the Russian Federation. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is what Mr. Putin uh, believed was the case, especially when Ukraine had applications in to join the U European Union, which didn't greatly trouble him, but also to join uh, the uh, NATO uh, treaty organization. Uh, which um, was seen as an existential threat. threat. And so uh, this is where things lie at the moment. And the question is, does anything that was done in the uh, expert group um, of uh, UNESCO back in 1984-85, uh, does anything done there have any messages or any lessons for us in respect of a solution to the, uh, the special uh, procedures or war that is now raging in Ukraine. Uh, fairly obviously, if there is to be any quick resolution of the war, there will need to be um, an exit policy, an exit policy both for uh, the Ukrainian Republic but also an exit policy for Mr. Putin. And the importance and urgency of an exit policy was made clear when in some throwaway remarks by Mr. Putin, he referred to the uh, possible use of um, uh, nuclear weapons uh, if uh, the Russian Federation faces an existential threat. Interestingly, Mr. Putin has also referred to a conversation he had with uh, President Clinton uh, when uh, the uh, Russian, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Russian Federation was set up. He asked Mr. Putin at one stage, would you allow the Russian Federation to join NATO? And uh, he didn't get an affirmative answer one looks back on those days of the initiative of Mr. Gorbachev and the initiative of President Reagan uh, and the question of Mr. Putin uh, and reflects on what happened in answer to that question and compares it what with what happened uh, in uh, the post-war period uh, of Europe. Um, it's, there are some similarities and some differences, but the greatest difference is that there really wasn't much um, uh, conviction that 
the United States had to provide an exit strategy. And that uh, is the reason that the talks that are going on or were going on in Istanbul uh, have uh, not produced any resolution and indeed they are presently in suspension. One would think uh, that if we look sensibly at our world, uh, we will see that many of the conflicts that exist or have existed or may exist in the future between nation states arise out of the issue of uh, the rights of peoples to self-determination. Just think of the flight path of QF1. It goes through Australia, where there are the First Nations peoples. Uh, there is the um, uh, East Timor issue. There are the issues of Southern uh, uh, Malaysia and uh, Thailand, uh, the issues of Afghanistan, uh, the creation of Pakistan, the issues of um, uh, Afghanistan uh, and the minority uh, races and religions in that country, uh, the Kurds, uh, and uh, then into Europe, uh, even lately, the position of the uh, of the peoples uh, on um, Corsica, uh, right up to the United Kingdom uh, with the peoples of Scotland and the peoples of Ireland, uh, and then over to the American hemisphere where you'll have the similar long list. <clears throat> this is a source of great danger and especially great danger in a world of nuclear weapons. The integer that has to be has to be written into uh, our thinking is the extra danger that has come about because of nuclear weapons and the uh, inclination of some people to make reference to them, or either directly or uh, by inference. So that's what I wanted to say. I, I naturally I think that the work that was done by the expert group on self determination of peoples. Um, is an important step forward, um, <clears throat> but um, how it can be used to find solutions to the Ukrainian problem uh, remains to be seen. Thank you, Michael. That's terrific. You've, mm -hmm. you've given us uh, some time for some questions. Great uh, his historical introduction and uh, good analysis and insight into some things a, a bit below the surface of what we get to see in just the regular media reports. Now we've got uh, one of our council members with a roving mic. If anyone in the audience here has a question, you can just put your hand up and we'll bring up, the microphone right there. to you. Well, that's while we're waiting for that, there's a question here online. I'm sorry, I've got to put it up on the screen, but have you considered Macedonia's right to self-determination in the light of the highly controversial pressures that have been imposed on it by despots in so-called liberal democracies like the USA and EU? There you go, that's an interesting question. Well, I think uh, I in fact had an associate after Colin, uh, he in the um, high court, and he was a Macedonian Australian. He'd come to Australia actually with no English at all. And he came top of the state of New South Wales in the higher school certificate. And he got double first class honours and medal at the University of Sydney. And he was just a brilliant man. Um, but uh, I then got to hear a lot about the Macedonian viewpoint um, and of the dispute about their using that name uh, in the, in the uh, wash up, it's now um, been accepted that they be called uh, the, the North Macedonia, Northern Macedonia, but for a very long time in the uh, United Nations family, they were called the former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that seems to have been partly settled, but Macedonia asserted the right of its people and they uh, established a separate republic and that separate republic is 
recognized throughout the world. And uh, so uh, I don't think that's as much of a problem as working out what the rights of people to self-determination, um, uh, what consequence does that have for the First Nations people of Australia? Will they exercise their right of self-determination to uh, enjoy that status uh, within the Australian Commonwealth? And these issues have to be considered in uh, any future debates about the voice from the heart and also any amendments to our constitution that give recognition to the separate and special status within the Commonwealth of First Nations people in Australia. Thank you. Are there any questions here in our audience or any further questions from anyone online? So none while, while people are thinking about that, I'll, I'll ask you this, Michael, do you have a view on what the exit strategy for each of these uh, two sides might or should be in order to reach peace and to end the war? Well, the lesson I learned from the work I did for the United Nations in North Korea, of, on North Korea, because we were never allowed to enter North Korea, but that wasn't a problem because there are 35,000 North Korean refugees in South Korea. Um, the, the lesson I learned about diplomacy is that you don't jump in with the most difficult problem, like nuclear weapons, you start at the edges and then you work your way slowly and gradually to the core issue that is most in dispute. But you build up experience in making small steps that uh, are fruitful. It did seem with reports earlier on that the diplomats in Istanbul were authorized by Mr. Zelensky on behalf of Ukraine not to press for Ukraine's admission to NATO. And it was reported that that had been actually withdrawn. Uh, and it was also said that um, uh, he would press for the European Union and the Russian Federation indicated that that could be tolerated. And so there was a, that, that was one of the steps on the periphery as you move forward. But uh, unfortunately, they are not meeting at all now. And uh, that has pulled uh, the whole process of peace talks to a close. And meantime, every night that I turn on Al Jazeera, I see uh, the huge toll of death and suffering that is occurring and also of destruction of the economy and of the buildings and of the infrastructure uh, and great damage to the exports of uh, Ukraine to the developing world that needs the grain. There is now a crisis mm. in feeding the world. Mm. So uh, somehow uh, we've, uh, we've got to get the diplomats to work on little steps. For example, in Korea, we, we recommended that they reopen the postal service, which remarkably enough doesn't exist between the North and the South, mm -hmm. that we reopen uh, the telephone service, that we uh, reopen some roads, uh, and uh, we establish sister city arrangements, and uh, other things, we open academic exchange visits, which was something done in Germany before it was united. Uh, you could take the steps of that kind, but uh, you've got to build up confidence and preferably you've got to build it up before a fait accompli has been achieved by one side to the conflict. Uh, the real danger of where we now stand is that the rules-based international order has been challenged. And what is important for the outcome of the Ukrainian special operations or war uh, is what is the next state that is going to challenge the international rules-based order? And okay. that is why both for nuclear weapons and more generally 
the what is happening now in Ukraine has lessons for us all in all parts of the world. And in the background are these extremely dangerous. You, uh, they talk of tactical nuclear weapons, but the material that I've read indicates that these sweet little battlefield weapons called tactical nuclear weapons are uh, devastatingly dangerous and once used would cause retaliation. And unfortunately, military and security personnel are not always um, uh, attentive to these great dangers and the big difference they've wrought in the international community and in di diplomacy and world peace. Michael, we've got another question here from uh, someone in our audience here at UQ. Hi, Michael. Uh, fascinating lecture. Um, as you rightly said, Ukraine and Russia are the largest exporters of wheat to the Middle East, and Russia is also the largest exporter of fertilizer. Um, wheat prices in the Middle East have already doubled in some places tripled. Um, the last time that happened, uh, that was a major catalyst for the Arab Spring. Do you envision a scenario in which massive instability in the Middle East leads to large refugee flows to Europe and Russia has issues on their border and that the Ukraine conflict sort of fizzles out to 2014 stages where it's a low level conflict and everyone else has larger issues to deal with in the Middle East? Thanks. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure that those who would be uh, giving advice for a settlement would have issues of that kind um, in their minds. I saw today that although the Russian trade surplus has gone up significantly since the Ukraine uh, Special Operations War began, uh, this is put down not to some uh, important economic advance in the Russian Federation because this is a very costly operation they've got themselves into, but it's because uh, by reason of the sanctions that have been imposed uh, on the Russian Federation, uh, they are not really exporting much and therefore they're not having to pay a large sums for uh, export and imports uh, and the net result of that is that although um, uh, states uh, in the West are still paying for uh, Russian uh, oil and gas, that is also dropping and uh, it's therefore not likely to um, uh, assist the Russian economy. So all of these things have ramifications and those ramifications we cannot fully see but hopefully some of those people who are meeting in Istanbul will have advisors who do see them Michael, not just military and security advisors. Michael I'm sorry to have to jump in but our um, zoom session shuts down at seven o'clock it's the national uh, AIIA so we're in our last 30 seconds probably so there's a couple of people whose questions we missed getting to but I just want to thank you and ask everyone to thank you for the uh, great talk you've given us tonight in the usual way. Thank you, Colin. Back to work. The AIAA Queensland and Australia appreciates the support that we get from you uh, on a continual basis and your willingness to make yourself available to all the people who are members and followers as you do. And all the best for your immediate and long-term future.